Can I just start by saying thank you very much to AWARE for the invitation to come and speak this evening. Um, I have never been in St. Patrick's Hospital before, so I'm just finding even the building quite fascinating. I have been aware of AWARE for quite a long time. A former work colleague of mine has been a member of AWARE for a very long time, a facilitator with AWARE, so I was always aware of, I was aware of AWARE, so I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to come along and talk this evening. I hope that what I have to say will be of benefit to you. I'm unlikely to talk for a full hour, so that you know, I'll be finished a bit sooner, and then I'm very happy to take questions. And you understand as well that the questions aren't filmed or recorded, so if people want to ask questions, I understand that that happens when the man at the front has stopped recording. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about is supporting the mental health of people living with life-limiting illness. And as a pilot of medicine doctor, what I tend to do is look after people with life-limiting illness. And sometimes you have this idea about what exactly is a life-limiting illness. And it's life-limiting illnesses are those illnesses which are progressive and invariably fatal. When you're talking about life-limiting illness, and particularly in the setting of palliative care, it's not very much defined by a time period. But you tend to think people who are maybe have maybe one or two, last one or two years of life or one or two years left to live. That's what you might think of in terms of life-limiting illness. And the idea about life-limiting illnesses, I suppose, arises from the concept of what exactly is healthcare for? What does healthcare do? So if you think about healthcare interventions, if you're going to your GP, you're going to your public health nurse, you're going to a hospital doctor, these are the type of things that healthcare interventions are for. So the first thing is about prevention. So in healthcare intervention, you're about trying to prevent health problems. And there's a very big emphasis on that at the moment, and there's a very big emphasis on that in relation to, you know, heart disease and strokes. So you're trying to, and part of the prevention of those is stopping smoking, losing weight, taking more exercise. I also think there's issues in relation to prevention of mental health problems, and some of that has got to do with how do you sort of build resilience? How do you sort of provide people with better understanding of their own selves and personalities so to help people, you know, avoid some of the mental health problems? So that's the first bit about healthcare. Second thing is cure. So healthcare, you know, the intervention of healthcare is about curing. So some of the interventions that you can use to cure people are antibiotics. So somebody has a bacterial intervention, infection, an antibiotic is there to cure it. But when I'm talking to medical students about curing, you're thinking, well, what exactly do you cure? How many illnesses do doctors cure? And in the overall scheme of things, not a lot. So a lot of viral infections will go away off their own accord. Bacterial infections are cured by antibiotics. There are some surgical problems, like, say, appendicitis. That can be cured by antibiotics or by surgery. So it's basically you have a problem, you have an intervention, that gets rid of the problem. A lot of healthcare is about maybe not curing, but rehabilitating and getting you back to better health. So there's a big, strong focus on rehabilitation. So that can be maybe people who've had strokes, people who have things like rheumatoid arthritis, you know, these bad arthritis problems. Again, I think in the mental health setting, there's a rehabilitation focus in mental health care. But I think the other part that health care is about, in the broader sense, is about main, trying to maintain people. So somebody may have a serious illness, um, but you're trying to maintain people as well as possible for as long as possible. But I think there are then those people whose illnesses are progressing and getting worse. And palliation is what I do. And palliation is about trying to address the physical and, and emotional and psychological problems of people with serious illness. And you're not able to change the course of the illness, but you're trying to improve the sort of the problems which arise as a result of the illness. And I suppose fundamentally, and maybe the end, what you're really talking about is people's comfort. I like this quote, which was actually in the National, the National Policy for Palliative Care that was written in 2001. This quote was in, the, was in the start of it. And it talks about what should doctors do. And the thing what doctors should do is to cure sometimes, to relieve often, and to comfort always. And I think if you think about that as what healthcare is doing, you hopefully is relieving, or relieving sometimes, no, curing sometimes, relieving often, but always being co- providing comfort. I say that was a sort of 16th century definition of what doctors should be doing. So if you think about life limiting illness and what counts as a life limiting illness, and sometimes people would have things like what doctors might call in general organ failure. So you may have heart failure, you may have kidney failure, you may have respiratory failure. Now, there's probably people in the audience here who are living with heart failure, but that doesn't mean that you're basically living with a life-limiting illness by my original definition, because people can live with heart failure 5 or 10 or 15 years. 
So many people can live with kidney failure, particularly if they're on dialysis, you can live with a kidney failure. So you may have an organ, you may have your, some of your organs not working properly, but when that's a stage where things are progressively getting worse, despite the best efforts to maintain your, your well-being, this can count as a life-limiting illness. You can have also then what are called neurological disorders. They're sort of things that affect the brain and the nerves that cause your, your health to deteriorate. Typically, in palliative care, one of the major illnesses we talk about is motor neuron disease. Because most people with motor neuron disease, their health will deteriorate and people may, may deteriorate and die sort of in three to five years. There are people who live a lot longer with that illness. There are people who live a lot shorter. But that's one of the typical diseases you think about that will count as a progressive and deteriorating illness. There are other um, neurological problems which, are, which can also cause your health to deteriorate. But they would be things like Parkinson's disease or dementia or multiple cirrhosis. But for those illnesses, for quite a lot of the course of the illness, there's a very strong focus on rehabilitation and maintenance of well-being rather than necessarily thinking that this is a general progressive to fatal illness. Very often people think about palliative care or hospice care. What they principally think about is cancer. And I would have started, as taken to a few women in the audience, I would have started working in palliative care because when I was qualified, when I was actually seven years working, so I was well qualified, but about 25 years ago when I was working in Bowman Hospital, if you had stomach cancer or bowel cancer, if it wasn't possible to cure it by an operation, it was an inevitable downhill decline. And I was working in the department where you made a lot of these diagnoses. Nowadays, people who may have stomach or bowel cancer, it may not be curative, but people can have chemotherapy, which is life-prolonging and which provides a very good quality of life. So cancer used to be one of these illnesses which is very much about that you got the diagnosis and it's downhill. And now there's more, much better, there are better cures for some of the cancers. So some of the cancers where there's better cures for would be things like breast cancer, some of the bowel cancer, some lung cancers. So there are better cures now available. So there's some of the life-limiting illnesses you might think about. But I think one of the things you need to think about what's life-limiting is life itself. Because it does come to an end. And then we may not necessarily want to think about it, but it is one of these things that you sort of, at a, the end point, is that our life will come to an end. So you could say, if you're talking about minding the mental health of people with life-limiting illness, you might say, minding the mental health of people. Because we are natural, our natural course is that our life will come to an end. And most of us don't think about that at all, ever. And some of us who and some of us who work in palliative care settings, you might think that we would have, you know, a better understanding and insight into it. Don't always. There's been interesting surveys done about asking staff who work in palliative care services how many of them have made wills. Surprisingly few. And you would have thought that if you work in a setting where you're encountering people who are very, very unwell, that you may have made a will. I haven't made a will. My excuse is I have no children. So there, because as far as I'm concerned, if you have children, you have to mind. I have no dependents, so it doesn't re- I really don't care about making a will. Sometime I'll get around to making it. But I can work in a setting where I'm aware, very much aware that people will die, but I can also then behave in many ways as if I'm going to live forever. Because it's not necessarily something you always want to think about. But it is, I suppose, a natural, a natural part of life. So there's some of the sort of life-limiting illness you might think about. So you might think, well, wh- why would you want to work in palliative care? What does somebody like myself do? And again, talking to the women in the audience there, I sort of said that when I, when I was working, as I say, as a middle-grade doctor, as a registrar in Beaumont, you were diagnosing people with an incurable illness and feeling the need to do something for them besides saying, I'm sorry, you've got cancer. Because a lot of these people had other problems. And I spent a bit of time trying to learn a bit about how you might improve things. But then I got working as a short-term job in London. And then I realised that this is what I actually want to do. Because in palliative care, you're about treating people, as far as I'm concerned, it's about treating people, not diseases. Because you're recognising the disease itself might not be curable, so you're then trying to treat the people. And palliative care, according to the World Health Organisation, the definition of palliative care, is to try and improve the quality of life through the prevention and relief of suffering, by the treatment of pain and other physical symptoms, by the treatment of psychosocial problems and spiritual problems. And it's trying to provide this for people who have an incurable or a progressive or a life-limiting illness. And the important things that you're trying to do there is about the early identification of problems. 
So you're trying to figure out, well, what problems do people have? Very good assessment of the problem, that you're trying to make a good assessment, then you're providing treatment and then reviewing of your, of your interventions. So that's a big part of what palliative care is about. And again, people traditionally think of palliative care as something that happens over there, and particularly over there meaning a hospice. And maybe people might think it's happening over there in a hospice, and also maybe very much for maybe the last days or weeks of somebody's life. But I think that palliative care is very much about trying to get involved in, in the care of people who have a life limiting illness, not just in the last days of life, not just when they've got very bad pain, not just in a hospice. But what you're trying to do is try and improve the care of people with life limiting illness. I do a fair bit of medical student teaching. And one of my questions I'm asking students, well, like, you know, question I sometimes ask students is, you know, like, why should you hear, why should you be here in this lecture learning about palliative care? Because, you, you know, when I think about it, no matter what bit of health care a doctor works in, they are going to be looking after people with life limiting illness. And it's one of the skills that they need to have. And this idea of having those skills is something which has become much more recognised internationally as well as nationally. And it's much more recognised that, that basically a GP or a cancer doctor or a neurologist or a nurse who's working in any of those areas or a nurse who's working in a nursing home or a care assistant who's working in a nursing home, they need to have an understanding of how do you provide support for people who have a life-limiting illness. <coughs> Because that's what they're going to be doing. It's providing care for people with life-limiting illnesses. So basically, palliative care... So I'm a specialist in palliative care. But I don't have to see everyone who's got a life-limiting illness. Because there's very many people with life-limiting illnesses who are being cared for by their GP. They're cared for by very good nurses in nursing homes. Because I think the idea of providing palliative care, of trying to address the physical and the psychosocial and the spiritual problems of people with life-limiting illness... It's part of what it is to be about providing health care. So if you're providing health care, you should be doing this. So it should be basically all healthcare staff at all grades in all settings. And as I say, this is something that's become recognised much more nationally and internationally. And part of the way the HSE they, has recognised that is that they've developed what they call a competency framework. It's basically saying, what is it that all healthcare staff need to know about palliative care? need to know about providing care for people with life-limiting illness. So the HSE has developed this competency framework, and it covers, I think, 14 different disciplines. So it's doctors and nurses and care assistants and physios and OTs and chaplains and social workers and dietitians. I think it's about 14. I couldn't... Please don't ask me to name them all. But it is that, like, what do staff need to know so the staff can provide care? Because in the same way I'm sure some people here have had experience of mental health problems... And some of these mental health problems are things which, you, which are transient, which are dealt with by support from family and friends. And some of them are a bit more complex, where you might have needed support from you know, people like GPs, who are sort of generous rather than specialists. And sometimes they're more complex. And your GP might say, this is not something I can deal with. I need more specialist advice. And similarly, palliative care problems are in a, come in a similar way. So there's some things which everyone should be able to provide support for. Some of the things that, that your GPs, your public health nurses, your general hospital doctors need to know. But then there are also then people who have got maybe more complex problems, and that's why you might need to have a specialist advice for that. So those are the sort of different levels. If you want to find out a bit more about palliative care, there's two places I direct you to. One is the Irish Association for Palliative Care. They have, on their website, they've got a very nice video which just explains what palliative care is about. Now, the IAPC, it's a, it's a, sort of, it's a professional organisation. So it's designed for staff who are working in any parts of healthcare. But it's a very nice video. It is about 10 minutes long. I was sort of wondering, should I show it today? And I thought, no, 10 minutes is probably a bit too long, but it's a very nice video. <coughs> the other place where you can find good information, and they're targeting the information at the public, is the All-Ireland Institute for Hospice and Palliative Care. Again, they've got a very good website, and they're trying to develop resources to help, to help those living with life-limiting illness and those who are caring for them. So the All-Ireland Institute for Hospice and Palliative Care, they have, they're have developing information for ad, palliative care for adults, palliative care for children, palliative care for, and information for staff. So again, it's another good source if you wish to go and have a look at things there. So, because a really important part, and I think we're talking about treating people, not diseases, 
If you're talking about looking after people's psychosocial problems as well as their physical problems as well as their spiritual problems, that people's mental health is a very important part of looking after those with life-limiting illness. It's a vital part of assessment and care in looking at people's emotional and psychological needs. Now, quick little experiment. And we're again not putting cameras here anyway, but has anyone here ever had a toothache? Okay. Do you remember was the toothache worse during the day or during the night? Day? Night? Hmm? Night? Okay. Night? Okay. Okay. Quick show of hands who thinks it's worse during the night. Yeah, I think the night I think the nighttime wind is. Now, if you think about it, during the day you're eating. During the day you're talking. So during the day you're ignoring your tooth. So why is it worse at night? And it's worse at night in some ways because it's like you've got, so you've got the physical tooth in your body and then you've got your mind winding you up. So at night time, you're thinking, I've got a toothache. It's very sore. I can't get to a dentist. I have nothing else to do. I've got a toothache. And your mind's going over this all the time. So during the day, you might be eating and thinking, mm, bad idea, I'll chew on the other side of my mouth. And you get on with life. But it's how your body and your mind are very interconnected. So it's what your physical body has, but also then how your mind affects it. And your mind both has your thinking, but also has your feelings. And I think that idea of your toothache, and I find sometimes that idea of explaining toothaches to patients and to families, it helps people understand why sometimes their symptoms vary. Because their symptoms can vary even though their illness, their physical illness isn't varying. Because what's also varying then is how, what they're thinking and what they're feeling. My major problem about using a toothache as an analogy for teaching is that for, if you talk to 20-year-olds, they've never had toothaches. You know, all got the good dental health. So they're looking at medical students age 25 on average. They've never had a toothache. I have to figure out a better analogy because how do you explain how your mind and your body can still work together and how what you think and what you feel, how that can change. So your toothache is no worse at night. Your tooth is no worse at night, but your pain is worse at night. Does that make sense to you? And I think your mind and your body are very interconnected. So, if you're thinking about the issue about mental health and people with life limiting illness, I was trying to figure out how best to structure this, and I thought I might just sort of divide it into things people who might have pre existing mental health problems, but then people who might develop mental health problems as a result of um, life limiting illness. And the pre existing mental health problems, and just basically talking about the major common ones. So, yes, in people who may have depression, including suicidality. So people may have already been suffering with that and then to get a diagnosis of something like, you know, advanced heart failure or cancer. People may be living with anxiety. You may have people who have got bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Another particular group of people who are living with addiction or substance misuse. Um, and the other important group are the people who have somatoform disorders. And people with somatoform disorder, and I keep on, I know the term for this changes, and I may have used the wrong term, but somatoform disorder are people where a lot of their emotions are felt as physical changes. So if you're somebody who, when your emotions are stress, your emotional stress may manifest as physical changes. So you may have somebody who has a history of depression and then gets a diagnosis of cancer. You may have somebody who has a history of substance misuse and then gets a diagnosis of, of bad heart failure may have somebody who has a somatoform disorder and every time they feel stressed, they feel like they're going to vomit, who then gets a diagnosis of can- stomach cancer. So you can sometimes have people already have an illness and then get a diagnosis of a life-limiting illness can then complicate their lives greatly. But also then you may have people who don't have a defined history of mental health problems, but as a result of a diagnosis of mental health problem, of life-limiting illness, may develop mental health problems. The commonest thing is what's called an adjustment disorder, an adjustment disorder is often considered like a temporary problem with either anxiety, usually anxiety or depression, which lasts for a, couple of we- a number of weeks in response to a diagnosis of a serious illness or bad news. You may, people may, though, develop, they may, may not be just an adjustment disorder. This may become persistent and become sort of like clinical depression or clinical anxiety. And one particular version of anxiety would be death anxiety, where people become very anxious just about the whole idea of dying. So, and these are actually very, very common. So depression affects people um, with life limiting illness. Depending on the research, 10 to 70%. Anxiety affects similar numbers, 10 to 70%. 
Sleep disturbance affects 30 to 40 percent. Insomnia. One of the problems sometimes about trying to diagnose mental health problems is that if you know, again, if you've ever attended, <coughs> if you've ever attended a doctor or nurse because you've got mental health problems, some of the questions they ask you about are very much about mood, and some of the questions they ask you about are very much about physical symptoms, because your mental health problems can also cause physical symptoms. So doctors learn that symptoms of depression include poor appetite, loss of weight, poor sleep. Symptoms of cancer are often poor appetite, loss of weight. You know, so how do you sometimes separate out the physical manifestations of a life-limiting illness from the physical manifestation of depression? Because a lot of the questions that you use to diagnose depression, are, can we, they, they can also be manifestation of the life-limiting illness. So sometimes depression might be missed because people attribute all the physical symptoms to the life-limiting illness rather than thinking about it being related to mood. The other reason why sometimes depression or anxiety can be missed because somebody might say, I'm very depressed, to which the response might be, sure, of course you are. You know? But like saying, being, a, being sad because you've got a serious illness is not the same as being depressed. Or being frightened because you've got a serious illness is not the same as being anxious or having an anxiety disorder. So it's sometimes got to do with the persistence of the sadness, the persistence of the low mood and the severity of it may mean that this is not just an adjustment to a serious illness, but an actual mental health problem of itself. So it's very common. And the fact it's very common is very well recognised in relation, say, in the palliative care community. So there's a journal called the British Medical Journal um, of support of palliative and supportive care. And it's published quarterly. But in the June this year, a lot of the articles they had were, very, were focused on mental health problems with people, with people with life-limiting illness. And I think it's part of the recognition that mental health problems for pe- can happen in people with life-limiting illness and it can, it can make the management of life-limiting illness more difficult. So these are some of the articles that are there. So one of the things we're talking about is like the role of meditation in the management of in helping informal and, for, and professional carers. So... This, this article was not about looking at patients with life-limiting illness, but looking at the professional and family carers of people with life-limiting illness. That's an article that came from the USA. And it found there's probably some benefit, but not an enormous amount of benefit, for meditation for informal and formal carers. Um, an article from Australia was looking at um, how do doctors, palliative care doctors, or deep people who are looking after people with life-limiting illness, how do they consider the causes of depression? Because sometimes, depending on how a doctor might consider what causes the depression, that might influence then the decisions they might make about treatments they recommend. There's an article then from New Zealand talking about people who've got death anxiety, which basically they're defining as people who've got a lot of anxiety in relation to death and the fear that they may die. And they found that it affects up to 37% of people, more likely to affect those with small children, which you can understand, more likely to affect those with physical symptoms. And interestingly, one of the physical symptoms that was associated with a greater rate of anxiety was changes in physical appearance. Which, again, you wouldn't necessarily think that if a change in physical appearance could have a, would increase your in-death anxiety, but that's one of the things they found. That people with more change in physical appearance as a result of their illness were more, had more death anxiety. And I'm going to move on. I'm just going to do a bit more about the desire for death. Because... Sometimes, when you talk, when you, if you listen to the media about, the, about people living with life-limiting illness, the thing that media likes talking about, yes, there's sometimes discussion about palliative care, there might be things about opening a new hospice, but the thing that really gets the media excited is about assisted suicide and euthanasia. Because that is an, that, that's an, like, an exciting news story rather than necessarily um, a reality on a day-to-day basis. So this was a study that was done in Canada. And in part of a large survey of over 700 patients who are attending eight different palliative care services in Canada. What they found is 12% had what you might call a persistent desire for death. So these are people who just wished it was all, all over, wished they were dead. So 12% of the whole 700. Of the 12% with a persistent desire for death, 58% of them had a mental health problem. So there's, it wasn't just there was a desire for death, but these are people who had a mental health problem associated with this. And those with a greater desire for death, so, first, so of those who didn't have a mental health problem, those with a greater desire for death tended to have greater physical symptoms. 
I read very often, like I would, and I very often, like many people in palliative care, might be asked about not by patients. You don't tend to get asked too often by patients about hastening death. You might get asked that by patients' families or by people in your social network or whatever. They might ask you for that about that. And for me, I think a lot of the times when if people have a desire for death, you're trying to figure out what is driving that. And is it mental health problems? Is it physical health problems? Are there things that you can do to improve this? And very often you can. Not all, always, but very often you can. That's about desire for death. So there are high risks of mental health problems for, pe- for all people who are living with a life-limiting illness. And these are some of the reasons why you might have these risks. And if you think about the list that's there, some of the things that affect the mental health of people who don't have a life-limiting illness. So you may have some things like fear of death, which is more got to do with life-limiting illness, fear of symptoms. But also then you may have this idea, fear of losing of independence. So people who are used to be able to manage themselves, thinking, if I become less well, will I be able to manage? Loss of control. You know, if you have something now happens that you have to attend hospital or take more medication or change your lifestyle, you can feel out of control. You can have a change in your physical ability, and that can, so that can then lead and compound this idea of loss of independence. Change in physical appearance, which I mentioned earlier. But I think the change in physical appearance is sometimes underestimated by healthcare staff. And interestingly, sometimes the change in physical appearance is considered more of a problem for women than men. There's no reason to support this view. But very often, people are much more likely to think if a woman's going to lose her hair from chemotherapy, they're more likely to wonder about her having a wig and getting that fitted than actually asking a man, well, do they want a wig? They might just assume men are used to losing their hair anyway. But it is that sort of the changes that people might get. A big part is change in role. So if you have a serious illness, it's likely to mean that you might be more tired, you might have more physical compromise, you might have to tend to hospital more often. And that can mean that you can't do your normal things. So your normal role in life, it might be that you run a major company or it might be that you run a household. And the thing is, it's not, so much what you're lo- it's not so much how important or how big your role was before. It's the fact that your role very often is a very important part of who you are. So you're a person who runs a home and then are very tired and can't run a home. That can actually can affect your self-esteem, your feeling of well-being. That can add to feelings of depression. People can feel isolated. And they can feel isolated partly because of maybe the change in role, <clears throat> that they can't get out to work and get out to socialise the way they used to. But also people can feel isolated because they don't... What they're going through is not what their friends and family are going through. So that you're, you're, there can be a feeling that you're in this by yourself rather than in this with other people. There can be fear of being a burden. That people may concern that because they're unwell, the family have to change their lives and that, that, that then can cause a burden to their families. They can have fear for their family. So what will happen to their family when they're gone? Who will look after their children? Who, who will look after their husband or wife who has dementia? So there are these sort of concerns that people may have about the, like the people that they normally care for, who's going, to, who's going to care for them into the future. And another reason why sometimes people might get um, mental health problems is the side effects of medication. Particularly, you may have medication that might affect, disrupt your sleep. You may have me- medication that might affect your thinking and your concentration. And there are sort of things that can also affect your mental health problems. <coughs> so, there's lots of reasons why people may develop um, mental health problems, if not necessarily a formal diagnosis. And I suppose what you're trying to then do is how do you help people in these sort of situations? So somebody who has depression, it may be, and I say I'm putting depression there, you may have depressive symptoms as part of an adjustment disorder, and, or you may have actual depression. And for people in an adjustment disorder, a big part of this is people trying to give people information and education. So people may have a better understanding of what's going on, have a better understanding of what's likely to happen, to have a sort of clearer plan about what the future is. And a big important thing here is supportive listening. And supportive listening is something that could be provide, that's very often provided by staff who work in, say, um, care of the elderly settings or cancer settings. So staff there are used to being... So although the main role might be being a physiotherapist or being a nurse in a nursing home, 
supportive listening is part of the role. It's just letting people express their feelings without necessarily saying that you need to change the feelings but allowing people to express their feelings. Supportive listening is also provided by, by trained counsellors or trained social workers. People who have depression um, are <clears throat> more likely to need something more formal rather than just supportive listening. They may need um, professional support and counselling. Something like cognitive behavioural therapy can be very helpful. But the challenge is that when people have a serious life degree illness, sometimes they're very tired. So it can be difficult sometimes to learn new skills and to maintain new skills. Medication can be very important. And I think this is where, as healthcare workers, we need to be clear, clear that like, if somebody is developing depression, what medication might help them? And I put down here two for one. There's quite a number of antidepressants which have other roles in a palliative care setting. So um, antidepressants, like some of the old antidepressants like amitriptyline can be very good for <coughs> if people have trouble sleeping. They can be very good if people have problems with nerve pain. Or they can be very good if people have problems, say people with motor neurone disease have problems with they can't swallow the saliva and have drooling. So if I have somebody who has depression and who might need an antidepressant, you think, okay, what other symptoms do they have? And rather than putting them on two different medication, put them on one that might cover a couple of things. So a two-for-one offer. And, then, <clears throat> and sometimes people like the idea that you give them one medication instead of two medications. A patient with anxiety. I think the, similarly with the, uh, with the um, adjustment disorder, same principles, information, education, and support of listening. But another important thing for people with anxiety is trying to think and learn relaxation techniques. I think that the idea about relaxation techniques, it's different people find different things helpful. And that can be anything from just very calming measures that you sort of think, okay, I need to just calm down and slow down my breathing. Or it can be something much more complex like guided meditation. Or it can be something like mindfulness. So different relaxation techniques that can help. Similarly then, if people have anxiety, you have more formal counselling. You also continue the relaxation techniques. But again, people may need medication for this. And the medication, they tend to avoid using benzodiazepines unless in very short-term use. And I would think that probably no more than two weeks. Because if people have anxiety, which is well-established, I think then they need to be on some medications, such as um, selective serotonin, you know, citalopram-type drugs, or ciprimab-type drugs. One of the things which I find quite fascinating is some of the times the patients I would meet who have multiple different problems. So they may have nausea. They may have poor energy. They may have constipation. They may be breathless. They may have pain. They may have depression. They may have anxiety. And it's amazing the number of people who are quite happy to take medication for all physical symptoms, but don't necessarily want to take it for an emotional or mental symptoms. And sometimes it's this idea that, like, if I was a better person, I'd be able to manage this. You're thinking, no, that's actually, this, you're a very good person. There's a lot to manage. And if you get stuck in this idea of being very anxious or very depressed, you may not be able to get over and manage on with other things. But it is, I can have these very interesting conversations where you can talk to people who are starting on morphine and starting on like two different anti-sickness tablets and two different laxatives. And then you mention something for their nerves. And they, oh, God, no, doctor. And it's trying to sort of see, well, what is this driving people's view of that? Why is it okay to take something for pain but not okay to take something for depression? And that's got to do with, I think, some of the expectations people have of themselves and expectation of what their mental abilities should be and something got to do with the whole stigma. As a palliative care doctor, sometimes I meet people who don't want to meet me because they get slightly frightened. And sometimes you meet people then, and first of all, they get over meeting me and then they say, and would you think about talking to a psychiatrist? And no. <laughs> because it's nearly like it's too much to be co- attending with. Because I would, in the same way that I would talk about that palliative care it should be something that all healthcare workers should manage. I would feel that as a doctor, I would have a good understanding of some of the basic things about managing particularly anxiety and depression. But if somebody's on an antidepressant and still very depressed, I then need to go for expert help. Because it's not something, you know, I can do straightforward stuff, but I can't do the expert things. And if people have other illnesses such as bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, I definitely need to look to an expert for that. Substance misuse, I'm just going to talk a bit about that. It's actually, 
when I had my chart there of people who had pre-existing disorders or acquired them as a result of life-limiting illness, it's actually very rare to acquire substance misuse as a result of a life-limiting illness if you've never had it before. So people who are put on morphine very rarely become addicted to it. People who are put on benzodiazepines very rarely become addicted to it. When I say rare, I mean something like 1 in 10,000 people might become addicted to morphine. But people who have, have a history of um, substance misuse in the broader sense, they're people I think are vulnerable for this to come back at them to flare up again. Because sometimes people have had a history of substance misuse. It is, they have, it could be, there's a few reasons for this. It could be that they are made differently to people who don't have a history of substance misuse. So their bodies and their the mind and the brain react differently. So in a time of stress, they feel things in a different way. But also sometimes people who have a history of substance misuse, it has arisen out of that this, is, that this is, has been a coping strategy for people with other life challenges in the past. So somebody who has had a lot of life challenges, which has contributed to them to maybe alcohol misuse or opioid misuse or, you know, um, they, to say maybe using heroin or things like that. People who have had that in the past... They are more, they are, then when they get a diagnosis of life-limiting illness, it can then lead them back down that track. Because part of, sometimes they, the chemical copers is the term that sometimes used. People who use chemicals to manage stress, been told you have a life-limiting illness is a very serious stress. and can put you back in that direction. And I think that's why I think it's, um, it's, good, like it's important I think, for doctors and nurses that to have an understanding of people's health problems in the past. So I very often would I would ask people, have they ever suffered from depression or anxiety? And people wonder, why am I asking that question? I'm asking that question because I know that a life-limiting illness can reactivate or reawaken some of these problems. And interesting that people who have a history of opioids, like say abusing heroin or morphine, they tend to have much more difficult to manage pain. And that, the question then is, is your body made in such a way that you feel things differently, so therefore you're more likely to end up abusing something like morphine? Or is it because you've been abusing morphine or heroin that's changed how your body deals with pain? But it does mean that people who have a history of heroin misuse, people on methadone maintenance, they tend to have much more difficult to manage pain. And that, you know, that creates other challenges. Because what you're trying to do is manage people's pain, but manage them safely and not causing further problems with the pain, further problems with addiction. So, when you think about people who are living with a life-limiting illness, and I think the title was like the minds and mental health people living with a life-limiting illness, and the people who are living with a life-limiting illness is the patient, but the patient's social network as well. Because no more than we are people who are physical bodies with a spiritual and emotional and psychological needs, we are also, most of the time, part of social networks. So you can't, in the same way that you can't just sort of say it's a toothache, a course is going to be, a course is going to be fine at night because you're not talking, but then if you're part of a social network, you've got family, you've got friends, and if you have somebody within your social network who's living with a life-limiting illness, that affects you as well. Because, again, it's the change of role. It's the change of responsibilities. It's the worry. It's the worry for the future. <clears throat> it's the concern about, you know, who's going to pick up the children from school if we have to go to the hospital for an appointment. All of these sort of things come in and just add to the stresses of both the patient and the family if somebody's living with a life-limiting illness. So how do you mind their mental health? And to be quite honest, having been here slightly ahead of the time and having sort of been wandering about a bit and reading some of the literature, I'm not too sure if the people who come to AWARE need a lot of information from me because I think a lot of this stuff is stuff that people tend to know. You need to, if you have a diagnosis of life-limiting illness, whatever you've found has helped you in the past, you need to be maintaining that. So if you're a person who finds that what I need to do to help me in the help me is that I need to meditate for 20 minutes in a day or I need to be able to just have a bit of quiet time to myself or I need to be able to just I need to I find that I need to go and meet my counsellor or my social worker or my psychologist once a month you need to maintain those things a problem sometimes is that sometimes people have practices which are very helpful but then become more difficult to manage if you get sicker 
So some people find a great way to manage their stress and anxiety is by running a physical exercise. If, you're getting, if you have a life-limiting illness where you get very tired, you may not be able to engage in that sort of level of physical exercise. And I think that's why it's probably good to see, have a few strategies rather than just the one, like just the one that which is just about physical activity. Because I think the physical activity is one that is harder to maintain. Really important to maintain links with support services. Because I think that, and whatever the support services are, and if the support services, that's their people that you go and play golf with or whether it's your local community, uh, community psychiatric nurse or what it, whoever it is that gives you that sort of support you need to try and maintain those links because they're the things that keep you on this, keep you well and when you're dealing with life you need to try and as much as possible engage with those sort of things really important about managing your medication because if you're on medication for mental health problems if, on, if you have mental health problems, if you're on medication for managing mental health problems, you need to share that sort of information with your new healthcare team. Because if you get diagnosed with a life limiting illness, you're likely to be engaged with a new healthcare team. And they need to know your issues, your problems, what medication you're on, because you need to then just try and manage this so that you have to manage your existing problems alongside your new problems. I sometimes counter people who sort of feel that. When, when they get a diagnosis of, say, a serious illness such as cancer, that is going to be life-changing and they're going to battle this and they're going to fight this, and sometimes, which I think is very good and appropriate to have that, but you're not going to fight these illnesses well by deciding, I'm going to be very strong and I'm going to come off my medication. And sometimes people do want to sort of think, okay, I want to put that behind me and just deal with the cancer. Unfortunately, whatever you've had there, you can't really put it behind you, it's with you. So trying to, whatever has helped you manage that, you need to take that with you while you're dealing with cancer or motor neuron disease. Say, so inform your new healthcare team of your previous diagnosis. Be alert to your own warning signs. So if you're living with mental health problems, you might know, how do I know when I'm sort of, when things are slipping? How do I know when I'm sort of, you know, when, when I'm sort of going off track? Is it that I sleep late for on, like, you know, I stay in bed till sort of mid-afternoon on Saturdays and Sundays. Is that, for me, a sign that things are going off track? Is it that I start taking a few more drinks than I should? What are your normal... Is it that I get ratty and irritable with people? What are your warning signs? And be alert to your warning signs. Thinking, okay, things aren't as good as they should be. I need to try and keep on track here. Because you're now encountering something that's going to put you a lot more stress on you. You need to then, I suppose... Link in with your support organisations, whether it's mental health organisations, but also sometimes the illnesses or the diagnoses you may have, they can provide support organisations. Um, and you may have things like, say, the Motor Neurons Disease Association or the Irish Cancer Society. They have different types of support which is available. Um, information technology is really important. And so writing this used wisely. I've looked at the AWARE web- website, a very wise website. But I'm sure you're aware that if you're talking about... If you're, information technology is amazing, the amount of information you can get. The difficulty is the amount of information you can get doesn't say anything about the quality of the information you get. I would always say to people, if they've got cancer, they need to go to the Irish Cancer Society or Backup, which is the UK equivalent, or the NCI, which is the National Cancer Institute in the US. And don't go anywhere else. Because you go somewhere else, there's people going to be telling you that if you sort of eat peach stones and... Um, and eat peat stones and drink 10 litres of water a day, you'll be fine. And they're the sort of things that come up. Like the ca- cancer's amazing. The amount of stuff, bad, mad stuff that's on the websites is actually quite incredible. So you need to know the quality of the websites. And that's where you need to talk to your healthcare professionals. You say, I'm a person who finds reading information very helpful. I like using the stuff on the internet. Where should I go? And ask the people who know. Because they say it's very easy to get directed off into, the, into um, not very helpful websites. I don't think I've anything much more to say. I'm not too sure if I said anything to you that's of new or of value, but um, I'm quite happy to take any questions. Thanks for your time.